Welcome back to the Mental Dietitian Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Lynch Potter. And today's episode is talking about what does healing look like? What is it actually? What is actually happening? The reason I had this theme is because out of nowhere, I've had a lot of people lately just kind of reach out to me saying, what do you actually do? What do you do in your coaching space? And it's a it's a simple question, but sometimes it's not an easy question to answer. And I've able I've been able to summarize what I do is I help people change their relationship with the past. Because that's what it is. Whether it's repressed emotions or suppressed emotions. So the difference between repressed emotions is that it's unconscious. You don't know that you're repressing them. Suppressing emotions is you are aware that you are avoiding the certain emotions. So we cannot change the past. We all know that that's a very logical thing that I'm saying, but what we can do is we can change our relationship with the past. Every single client that I've ever worked with, whether it's clients going through ketamine infusions, whether it's clients going through other plant medicine, therapeutic sessions, whatever, ceremonies, or whether it's athletes I've worked with, jiu-jitsu athletes, MMA athletes, or just the regular person, what is what the issue is, is there is suppressed and repressed emotions that are keeping them stuck in certain patterns within their nervous system with certain patterns and behaviors that are causing them suffering. But those same behaviors and patterns are also benefiting them. So if you want to really change your life, you have to look at how what it is that is causing your suffering is benefiting you. Human beings do not do anything unless there's a benefit. I saw this quote recently. It was on Instagram. It says, an addiction is any behavior or pattern that does not serve you. It's like, no, it's not. No, it's not. Addiction 100% serves you. And that could be addiction to your thoughts. It could be addiction to certain emotions that you have. What do I mean by addicted to emotions? It means that you constantly can't help yourself but thinking about sad, negative things. And you just you just can't help it. A lot of people don't think of that as an addiction. I see it as an addiction. I do see it as an addiction. You see meet people who are negative and all they talk about is negative things and they just run everything through the lens of the world that life happens to them things are constantly happening to them when in reality life happens for you everything has happened for you and that's what it really is when i work with a client and what healing is if i could sum up what healing is it's alchemizing the lens of this happened to me whatever it may be i've had clients and i've known people personally that have alchemized childhood sexual abuse that is bad as it gets for a human being and alchemize it and realize it happened for them and if it hadn't have happened they wouldn't be who they are today with all the unique perspectives gifts everything that they see the world and how it has benefited them that might sound strange hearing that and you might have something that triggers in you be like i i i don't agree with that i can't see i'm not saying i'm not saying that anybody should ever go through that what i'm saying is like i said it before you can't change the past it's impossible this i can't go back and unsnap my fingers it's impossible that moment is gone but what i can do is i can change my relationship with the past and a good coach, therapist, psychotherapist, whatever it may be, whoever you choose to work with in your journey, if you feel like you need to go on a journey like that, or just even with yourself, it does it does uh, 
it does benefit to have somebody who is not you helping you though. Let me tell you that. Um, it's about changing your relationship with the past. I've worked with clients currently and in the past who have had horrific things happen in their past as part of their journey of being a human being. So for example, somebody grows up with very unsafe parents, behaviorally, maybe it's a an alcohol abuse or it's a drug abuse or it's physical abuse or even sexual abuse, whatever that may be. The benefit that I've seen from my clients and the way that they operate and the way that they, and this can also cause suffering. So just bear in mind that some of our greatest gifts are also some of our greatest curses. It depends how you harness them and how you alchemize them into a good thing or a bad thing. So for example, I know somebody that I've worked with that can figure out what somebody is like very quickly, like unbelievably quickly, like, oh, that person struggles with this. I'm like, how do you know that? Like, I can just tell. I just know. I'm like, no, there's no way. Like, that, you just met them. There's no way you can be right about that. That person I've seen is right 90% of the time. It's a friend of mine. Blows my mind. But the reason why this person has this almost superpower is because they could tell when somebody would drive in the driveway when they were younger based on the tires hitting the rocks and when they come into the driveway, the sound of it, they could tell what that parent's behavior was going to be like when they walked in the door. Were they going to be drunk? Were they going to be sober? That hyper alertness, that hypersensitivity within their nervous system has allowed them to have an amazing sense of who somebody is. That is a superpower. But also having your nervous system wound up since you were four, five, six years old for 30 years is a very bad thing. I'm going to say, I don't, I don't like using the word good or bad, but you can only do that for so long until your nervous system shuts down. It's like, I'm done with some kind of dis-ease. Lack of ease it could be cancer. It could be depression. It could be anxiety. There's some kind of dis-ease that happens within the nervous system because it it needs to it needs to regulate itself. It needs to go back to what is a relaxed, calm state. And a lot of people's lives, they have lived and constructed and built lives upon this highly dysregulated nervous system. So when they want to start healing that nervous system, say it's causing them issues, where that intense drive that somebody has based on fear is just causing them now to be burnt out. Something I've, I've said with my clients around fear is fear is like high octane fuel. If you guys have ever seen drag races or if you've ever, if you're into cars or, or know anything about that, high octane fuel burns hot and it burns fast. So you will go very fast with high octane fuel. You'll get higher speed because it burns faster, but you won't be able to go as long. So I see fear, and this is my own personal journey. I used fear as a fuel most of my life, everything. I'd be very scared. And I would purposely, this is a more of a repression kind of thing that, I would, that I've that i only realized in the past year, where I would feel comfortable and safe, which was quite an unfamiliar feeling for me. So because it was unfamiliar, I was actually uncomfortable with it. So I'd go back to what was familiar and comfortable, which was being scared. And then I would use fuel as rocket fuel to propel myself out of that feeling because I also didn't like it at the same time. Being scared and being afraid and not feeling safe isn't very fun. But if you're used to it, the devil you know versus the devil you don't, right? So I would use it as fuel, high octane fuel. It burns fast and it burns hot, but it burns you out. And that's those kind of people struggle with um, 
wanting to regulate their nervous systems with all kinds of things, with drugs, sex, um, exercise, all kinds of things. They're trying to, it's that, that fuel you're using, which is fear. It's a lot and it burns you out real quick. And then you feel kind of deflated. You'll go into behaviors to soothe yourself. Then other things fall off. So for example, if somebody, is, I was in sales, right? So I'd burn, I'd just go hard, make a really big paycheck in that month. And the next month I'd be so burnt out from using fuel, the high octane fear fuel as fuel that I would have a bad month. And that bad month would make me feel scared. And then I would go back to the high octane. And I did that loop for years, years and years and years, most of my life in different areas, extreme commitment to something, then falling off, extreme commitment, then falling off. And it's exhausting. Love, however, is a fuel that is, it never ends, never runs out. Love is tied to your purpose. So I, for a long time, I didn't understand when people said, oh, just you need to find something you love to do. And I had this mindset, it's like, no, I need to find something that works. And if it works, I'll learn to love it. And I think the real accurate answer is somewhere in the middle of that. The Japanese call it ikigai. Ikigai is something you should definitely research, which is what you're good at, what you love, what uh, what the world needs. If there's another factor here. I'm thinking of getting it. It's like what you love to do, what you are very good at, what you can get paid to do. I think that's what it is, what you can actually get paid to do. Because you could love something and be really good at it, knitting cat sweaters, but does the world pay you for it? Not really, probably not, unless maybe cat sweaters actually in this day and age could be a thing, who knows? But the four factors are, does the world need it? Can you make money doing it? Do you love it? And I, whatever, I, I literally forgot the last one. I just said it. Anyway, research it. Ikigai is fuel from a more centered place, a more loving place, a more you place, a regulated place. And we only become regulated by changing our relationship with the past and the and the programs and the behaviors and the systems that we created, but also are enmeshed in our DNA and integrated into our DNA from our parents and from their parents. That's what people call generational trauma. It's a real thing. I've seen it within myself. I've seen it with, within others. And just questioning like, is this me or is this a force that has that is still me that I've contributed to but also started before me I imagine a, a rope right a rope maybe the rope existed before you were born but as you have gone through your life you have layered strands to that rope so it becomes thicker and thicker and then when you have children if you don't sever that rope whatever it may be addiction alcoholism people pleasing whatever it may be whatever whatever ropes flow through your family whatever ties flow through your family that have existed possibly for thousands of years who knows if you don't sever those you will give them to your children you will it you cannot you cannot Trans not transfer something unless you've transformed from it. Unless you transform the rope for this analogy, the ties that run through your family, you will transfer them to your children. You will. I'm sorry, but you will. That's why I believe that my number one job while I'm here on this earth is to do my inner work because as I expand inwards, my life expands outwards. I can't argue it anymore. Too many synchronicities happen, too many things. And this is where 
you start connecting to a higher source. I could use the word God. I could use the word Allah. I could use the word the universe, source energy. I know what it feels like. And I know when I'm connected to it. And I also know that using tiny little human words and tiny little human concepts cannot sum it up at all. I like the word, I like the description, the one with a thousand names. I like that. Because as you expand inwards and you get and you let go of all these patterns and all these behaviors and all these things that run rampant through you, which cause you to disconnect from yourself. Because if you disconnect from yourself, how could you ever connect to if you're religious and you want, and, and that's how you run your lens through things, how could you connect to God if you are not connected to yourself? How could you connect to Allah if you are not connected to yourself? If you are avoiding things within yourself and you are avoiding motion, emotions and you are victims to these behaviors and these patterns and they and you can't control them, or at least that's what you think, how could you ever be connected to your God, whatever that is? And that's how I explain it to Christian people, especially who I've worked with, that have a very difficult time when it comes to working on trauma or working with potential psychedelic therapy and things like that, is they think, a lot of them think, that it's going against God or going against their religion. When in reality, if they clear out the patterns and the beliefs and the things keeping them stuck, it allows source, God, Yahweh, whatever, the one with a thousand names, to directly connect to them. And I've had my own relationship with that, and I can't deny it. It's things start coming your way. It's strange, but I'm not going to argue with it anymore. People start reaching out to you. I've had people be like, oh, I want to I wanna do some coaching with you. I'm like, oh, okay. And I don't, I'm not advertising. I haven't even got my website up and running yet. And people are floating my way because of the work I've done, because of the work I've done within myself. Everything seems to expand and contract based on your willingness to expand within you. But life will also expand and contract just naturally. There's seasons of life. So you could be doing all the right things, doing all the right, regulating your nervous system all you want, but one day your parents will die. That will be a contraction. One day your pets will die. One day you'll get sick because you can talk about the spirituality side of things and expanding and being connected to God, all of that. But you're still a finite human being that is getting older, that is going to die. And that's the journey of being a human being. So you have the spiritual world where you can expand and things start attracting to you. But you also have this human world where you can roll your ankle and break your ankle off a curb, or you can get in a car accident, or the people you love around you can die, and it doesn't seem, it doesn't feel fair. It's not fair. But again, the more you do your inner work, the more you can see how did, what did I get out of that? What did I learn from that? And that I truly believe to sum it up, that's what healing is it is being a river, not a dam. Imagine a river. Imagine there's logs floating down this river. Imagine each log is an event in your life. Maybe you have children. Maybe you get married. Maybe you get divorced. Maybe people die around you. I've had some of my best friends die. My best friend, Ben Geldart, one of my very good friends who I lived with, Joshua Blunt. Those two men are gone. They're gone from this physical world. And they are, their deaths was like a log floating down that river. We can either choose to clog that river and then everything backs up behind it. And then all of a sudden our lives become a dam. 
and all this stuff is built up and suppressed in the background of our lives. Or we can stand on the edge of that river and feel that log go downstream. And sometimes it come, loops back around, I've found. Sometimes that's what grief does, is it comes in waves. Like, oh, I thought I already dealt with this. No, you will deal with this the rest of your life. But as long as we are able to keep open and keep our heart open and keep our vessel that is this human vessel that we are living in open, then when the good stuff comes, the good stuff, like I said, I don't like good or bad. I like expansive or contractive. When we label something bad, we don't want to feel it. So most people don't want to feel their bad emotions because they label it as bad. If you label it as contractive, if something contracts, contractions, you are giving birth to something new. It's temporary. It's going to contract and then it will expand. But if you keep avoiding the contractions, you will, you will avoid the expansions too. So these are all things I've learned. These are all things I've worked with my clients with and explaining these concepts and using these analogies that I use with people and you listening to this is if you start seeing it through that lens, life becomes, it doesn't become easier. You just stop clogging your own rivers and streams and waterways and you realize that it's not about that. It's about just being open to whatever comes your way and there will be immense pain and there'll be immense magic. And your job is to feel all of it. That's your job. That's the purpose of life. That's the purpose of life. I think that's the meaning of life is to feel everything that this life can bring you. And if you shut off to certain feelings, then there's a equal and opposite reaction. It's the laws of physics, cause and effect. If you shut off your sad emotions and you never allow yourself to be sad, then you'll also shut off your happy emotions. So love you. Hope this episode helped and we'll see you next week.